afternoon and good evening to all our speakers, chairs, and the distinguished audiences of the ACNS webinars in different parts of the world. We are back again with this last session of ACNS webinars in the month of September. For this webinar, we have two great speakers and two wonderful chairs with us. The speaker for the first session of today is our honored guest and senior faculty from Hong Kong, Professor Calvin Mack. Professor Mack is a consultant neurosurgeon at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Hong Kong. He is the honorary clinical associate professor at the Department of Surgery, Faculty of Medicine at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He is also the honorary secretary of the Hong Kong Neurosurgical Society. He has had an extremely meritorious career and has won many awards and accolades for that. And he has published several articles in various peer-reviewed journals also. He is an invited faculty for various conferences and workshops conducted all around the world. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker and today is going to talk about endoscopic transorbital approach to skull base and beyond. The speaker for the second session of today is one of the most celebrated personality who needs no introduction to you, Professor Armando Basso. Professor Basso is the Emeritus Professor of Neurosurgery at the University of Buenos Aires, Argentina. He has had a long outstanding career as the Chief of Neurosurgery at the Hospital Santa Lucia and Hospital of Clinical Jose de San Martin at the University of Buenos Aires. He was the past president of Argentinian Society of Neurosurgery in 1986 and the president of the Latin American Federation of Neurosurgical Societies in 1988 and the president of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies in 1993. He has been decorated with several awards and honors in, his, in the past for his excellence and dedication towards neurosurgery. He was decorated with the Order of Legion of French Republic for his extreme dedication to neurosurgery. He has also received the Lifetime Achievement Award for the Société de Neurochirurgie de Lang Francaise. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker at our webinars and today he'll be talking about lessons learned from 3,500 pituitary surgeries. The chair for the first session of today is another giant in the field of neurosurgery, Professor Walter Jean. Professor Jean is the Chief of Neurosurgery at the Lay Valley Health Network, Pennsylvania. He is also the professor at the Department of Neurosurgery and Brain Repair at the Morsani College of Medicine, University of South Florida, and the clinical professor at the Department of Neurosurgery at George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Professor Jean is the recipient of several awards and grants for his outstanding contribution to neurosurgery. His academic excellence is evident in the scores of publication that he has published over the years in various peer-reviewed journals. Professor Jean has kept his commitment to teaching the young neurosurgeons globally with his online monthly lectures that he has named The Surgeon's Log. He is also the founder and chief executive officer of Global Brain Surgery Initiative, which is the global neurosurgery education organization. We are extremely honored to have him today to chair the session of Professor Calvin Mack. The chair for the second session of today is our honored guest from Italy, Professor Marco Fontanella. Professor Fontanella is the associate professor and chief of neurosurgery at the Neurosurgery Clinic, University of Brescia, Italy. He was the past president of the Society of Italian Neurosurgeons. He is the current assistant treasurer of the WFNS and was the chief of Web of Publication Committee of WFNS. He is a noted researcher with several publications in various peer-reviewed journals. He is an invited faculty to various workshops and conferences organized worldwide. We are extremely honored to have him today to chair the session of Professor Armando Basso. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers, chairs, and the distinguished audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this virtual podium to our first chair, Professor Walter Jean. Thank you very much, Raja. Um, I, I must say that uh, as far as international neurosurgery is concerned, you take the prize for the speediest and most uh, well-spoken introductions around, around the world or any of the webinars ever. I've never heard anything like that. Your, your speed talking is, is bar none the best in the world. So I am honored to chair this uh, session, having been a, a, a presenter once before. And uh, I'm gonna share just one my one slide to talk about uh, uh, Dr. Mack and, and, and so on. Why I'm showing you this old picture of Hong Kong. Uh, this uh, is a 1940s uh, in, in Bukvalam in, in, uh, over the island side, and this is St. Mary's Hospital. The reason why I'm showing you this is that uh, this is where the Hong Kong neuros neurosurgery was born. Uh, the first neurosurgeon in Hong Kong started neurosurgery in Hong Kong, 1956. Uh, we we're talking about Professor H.L. Wen, uh, and um, and, and so for the last 55 years, Hong Kong neurosurgery has uh, been evolving uh, to a point today where there are many, many talented neurosurgeons in Hong Kong and uh, the Neurosurgical Society of Hong Kong is very uh, is booming. And as Dal Raja introduced, Dr. Mack is of course the secretary of the HKNSS uh, and he is uh, 
behind, as, as young as he is, he is behind a long line of very talented neurosurgeons who are thriving in Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, he's taking the world stage today in this talk. Uh, he and I share uh, something in common in that we, we, well, I am from Hong Kong, obviously, and, and I, we're, we're both uh, aiming to, to pull Hong Kong into the world stage whenever we can uh, on the neurosurgical scenes. So uh, now I'm going to stop sharing that. Um, you know, the transorbital approach is becoming more and more uh, of a, a workhorse approach in, in skull-based surgery, and it's now one of the standard uh, corridors that all skull-based surgeons need to consider uh, for approaches into the middle fossa uh, and, and beyond that. And um, uh, I do some of it, and uh, Calvin does a lot more of it than I do. And so without further ado, I want to hear his thoughts about whether he does it with an endoscope, microscope, exoscope, whether he takes off the rim or not, and how he does the approaches and so on. So I'm going to turn the podium to him and we'll come back with some questions at the end. Calvin, please. Thank you very much, uh, Walter, and thank you very much, uh, Raja, for the very kind introduction. And um, well, uh, again, it's really my honor to be able to um, speak on this uh, wonderful um, ACNS uh, webinar platform, which um, I personally have attended a few actually before, and um, they're fantastic. Uh, all the speakers are fantastic. and. Um, and a really uh, world international standard. And so me being a young uh, neurosurgeon, um, I am really thrilled to have this um, privilege and opportunity to share. And uh, thank you very much, Walter, for your kind introduction. So uh, without further ado, um, um, I'd like to take um, the upcoming uh, 40 minutes or so to um, share the topic, um, endoscopic transorbital surgery to the skull base and beyond. So, um, oh, actually, before I go on, um, um, this, um, if you can see from the background, the, um, the um, photo here in the upper part is my hospital, Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Hong Kong. The lower part, um, I will tell you what is it uh, later if, um, you know, if you cannot figure it out, okay. So, um, um, so this is um, where I'm from, uh, QE, Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Um, it is established uh, since uh, 1963. So it's a very um, um, old hospital in Hong Kong with uh, over 2000 beds. It's a, it's a tertiary referral neurosurgical center. And it's also a teaching uh, hospital here. So this is where my um, hospital is. And um, um, so um, because it's quite, um, old with some history already. So we're actually moving forward um, in 2025. In a few years time, we are moving to a new place, an entirely new place. It's a neuroscience center, which uh, we will have some fascinating new um, gadgets and tools, including a hybrid theater with intra CT, MRI, angio suite, uh, robotic surgery, smart OR with um, high speed connectivity. We also have 5G or or maybe 6G afterwards, um, full capacity in your HDU. We're going to have um, over 100 beds. Um, we're going to have a lab, uh, clinical trial center. And of course, we are looking for um, expanding international collaboration. So for this talk, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So um, I believe that uh, most of the attendees here are neurosurgeons. So um, the orbit, um, it might sound a bit um, um, uh, familiar, yet it's not so familiar to all of us. So let me go through this anatomy uh, to everyone first. So this is the uh, orbit. It's made of um, several bones, we all know. So what is so peculiar about it, it's actually, it's a window to the um, skull base. So um, just um, uh, directly behind it is the middle cranial fossa, uh, and um, more superiorly, it's the anterior cranial fossa. So um, when we all look from uh, above, so for example, when you're doing the terrional craniotomies of TLZ, FTOZs, from time to time, we actually enter the orbit. So the uh, um, crux of the, of the matter is that why not we approach it from below instead of from above? Uh, for the window that is through the orbit, we can actually are able to reach the middle cranial fossa and also the base of the anterior cranial fossa. And immediately, uh, there are the um, uh, sinuses. Um, the medially is the sphenoid sinus, inferiorly is the maxillary sinus, and um, superior medially is the frontal air sinus. And then laterally, it is bound by the temporalis muscle. So these structures are all that we're um, actually familiar with uh, as neurosurgeons. So this is the view, the schematic diagram, uh, when we view from, about, from, uh, from in front, from anteriorly. 
the um, yellowish orange yellow here depicts the route that we approach from craniotomy. So this is essentially a superior and lateral approach. Uh, these uh, would be the um, optic apparatus, the carotid artery and the cavernous sinus. Uh, this is of course versatile, but it um, involves um, a lot of bone work and brain retraction and uh, all the manipulation that is required. So here comes the uh, endoscopic endonasal approach, which is of course uh, fantastic. Um, I believe uh, Professor Basso will talk a lot more about it later. Um, this is uh, a medial corridor uh, and uh, it is um, uh, good in the sense that it can approach lesions uh, that is medial to the carotid artery, medial to the neurovascular structures. And of course, um, if we drill the pterygoid plate, then we can go uh, lateral to the cavernous sinus. But uh, by doing so, it's actually essentially crossing the neurovascular structures, which is um, actually less desirable. So here comes the transorbital uh, corridor. The transorbital corridor is actually um, uh, a lateral and an anterior direct uh, corridor to the lateral part of the cavernous sinus. So uh, as you can see here, this window, uh, complements with the green window. So with the approach uh, by the transorbital corridor, which offers an access to the lateral part of the cavernous sinus. And medially, uh, it can be accessed easily uh, by the um, endonasal corridor. So this actually complements and uh, finishes off the um, missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle uh, with, the, of course, the endoscopic approach to the infratemporal fossa, to the middle cranial fossa, and to some of the lesions over the cavernous um, sinus and more. And of course, we have two orbital windows left and right. So this um, is, very, is a very versatile window, yet it's minimally invasive. So endoscopic transorbital approach, I like to use this term ETOA. It's also known as the TONES, um, transorbital neuroendoscopic surgery, which has been described by uh, an ENT surgeon, Mo. Um, it offers minimal access and um, to the to the um, middle cranial fossa, to the skull base, and it is um, minimally invasive. It essentially is orbitotomy uh, to the skull base because when we do the orbital uh, drilling, uh, we create an orbitotomy. And on contrary to the craniotomy, it offers a fantastic um, window from anterior and directly to the skull base. And as I said, it is a corridor lateral to the uh, carotid and the cavernous sinus. So how do we approach uh, to the um, um, uh, uh, transorbital corridor? There are different types of um, skin incisions. It's actually quite an old slide that I've been using um, um, uh, in the past. Uh, but nowadays, uh, when we collaborate with the uh, oculoplastic surgeons in, in our hospital, um, the um, eye experts actually tell us that and share with us that there are actually a lot more uh, skin incisions. Uh, but in essence, uh, they can be divided into four um, quadrants, namely the superior eyelid uh, incision or the lid crease incision, uh, the uh, medial, it will be the pre uh, caruncular incision, the preceptal uh, incision, and also the lateral retrocanthal incisions. So uh, now uh, when we have more experience, actually for the superior uh, quadrant, we also can um, consider using the subbrow approach. Um, for the medial part, we can use a um, lynch incision. Uh, for the uh, inferior corridor, apart from preceptal, we can also use a swinging eyelid incision. Um, etc. So there are actually more and more um, uh, fancier names that I can go on and on. Uh, but essentially, they're just uh, incisions either over the skin or within the um, conjunctiva uh, to approach the uh, orbit that is um, bound between the bone and also the uh, orbital content. So this is uh, one of the commonest um, incisions that we use um, uh, for daily practices for transorbital approaches. So this is a lid crease incision. So this is a case that we did um, uh, in the past. So this is, um, we use um, a bovi, bovi to uh, do the skin incision. So this is a lid crease. And then uh, we cut into the um, um, uh, fascia and the muscle here. And then we use a handheld uh, malleable retractor to protect the orbital content. So 
Um, I'd like to draw attention to this uh, green um, corneal protector that we use um, for um, almost every cases uh, to protect the cornea from um, uh, um, being um, uh, scratched or from being um, uh, um, injured by the instruments. So next, uh, we do the incision directly onto the uh, orbital rim, and here is the bone. And then for this case, we also uh, use a, a freer to release the lateral canthal ligaments to increase the access um, to the um, uh, orbit. This is actually an optional uh, maneuver. And we also flatten the orbital rim uh, next uh, with the um, uh, diamond burr. So making a keyhole here, uh, which is uh, well described by the um, octoplastic surgeons, um, cosmetically, it doesn't um, have any problem uh, because it's actually a curved, um, curving inwards structure. So when we um, close the um, wound, uh, it doesn't have any uh, cosmetic uh, problem. It, you don't see any indentation there. Okay, so a variation is a removal of the supraorbital rim, uh, which Walter have uh, briefly mentioned it. So in one of the cases we did um, uh, by the uh, same as the um, uh, lid crease incision, and then we protect the orbital content, the periorbital, uh, which is very important. Uh, we don't want to um, disturb the periorbital uh, fat, otherwise it will keep coming out and it will disrupt the um, um, view of the uh, endoscope. And um, we remove a um, two centimeter a small piece of bone, um, which is very small. And, um, but it creates a, a lot of more space um, for the surgical instruments to put in. And then after the operation, we put it back with um, two um, titanium plates. So here is the um, 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 concept why we want to sometimes remove the, uh, the supraorbital rim. So this is the um, orbital content, and this is the endoscope, the yellow one. And the um, gray one is um, the um, instruments that we put in either suction or the um, uh, dissectors, et cetera. So this is the uh, space uh, that uh, we can use uh, without uh, drilling the um, uh, orbital rim. By removing the orbital rim uh, that is uh, uh, enclosed here um, by the um, orange uh, circle here, you can see that the surgical maneuver maneuverability actually greatly increased. Um, and it can also prevent um, exerting excessive pressure to the orbital content. There have been um, different um, literature describing that um, the orbital content can be displaced within one centimeter without much problem. Um, so it's actually a very small space that you as you can imagine. So especially when we're developing the corridor uh, from the beginning. So by removing the uh, superorbital rim, it can uh, increase the um, surgical corridor and the uh, surgical freedom by quite a lot. So how big is the surgical um, corridor that can be increased by removing the rim? Um, this is actually one of the studies that we're um, doing, um, uh, conducting in our center. Uh, with uh, my colleague, um, uh, Dr. Ben, I think uh, he's in the audience uh, today as well. So um, this is um, the um, schematic diagram that um, we're um, going to study, uh, that, that removing the different types of the um, uh, orbital rim. Um, and um, so this is A, B, and C, different types of uh, orbitotomy. And by D, this is the um, surgical, surgical freedom and the surgical corridor that um, uh, is uh, available by without removing the, the um, orbital rim. So we're going to um, uh, calculate uh, this um, um, different types of orbitotomy um, versus the uh, surgical freedom and the maneuverability. And uh, our data actually shows that it can increase up to sixfold of the, um, of the uh, space that is available. And uh, it's um, under um, submission to the uh, journals uh, currently. So um, step two, after the uh, skin incision, uh, next step is to drill the greater wing of the sphenoid. So where is the greater wing of the sphenoid? Uh, here is the greater wing of sphenoid, which actually is the orbital wall. This um, um, 
um, cadaveric uh, dissection, uh, which is a work that I've had done in a uh, La Zeng hospital with uh, Professor Sebastian Frodish, which is uh, the answer actually to the to the photo uh, in my title slide. This is where I spent the time there in the cadaver lab, and um, this is the work that I did. Um, so uh, when we put in the endoscope, uh, this is over the left side. The first structure that we are able to identify is the manangal orbital band, the MOB, which is the um, most anterior structure. Uh, to the uh, superior orbital fissure. So um, uh, when we uh, protect and uh, retract the periorbiter, we're able to see the IOF as well, the inferior orbital fissure. And bound by this triangle is the SOF and the IOF. This is the lateral orbital wall, which is equivalent to the greater wing of sphenoid on the other side, on the flip side. So we use a diamond burr with a self-irrigation and of course, protecting the periorbiter to keep it intact. We're able to see, to see the temporal dura, the middle fossa dura, and here is the sphenoid ridge. And um, by peeling the uh, temporal dura upwards, uh, lifting it up with a peri uh, osteum elevator, uh, the middle cranial fossa floor uh, can be visualized. So again, um, with the magnified view, the extradural dissection through the manacle orbital band is very crucial. Uh, this is actually the first uh, door to unlock the uh, temporal dura from the periorbiter. Otherwise, um, the temporal dura would be uh, um, quite um, uh, closely stuck to the periorbiter, which if we do not uh, dissect um, the manacle orbital band, uh, the peeling of the um, temporal dura away from the periorbiter is going to be very difficult. And the worst of it is uh, it will create a lot of excessive pressure transmitted to the um, uh, periorbiter and so the orbital apex, which um, the orbital apex syndrome can be one of the uh, post-op uh, uh, morbidities. So after unlocking the MOB, um, we are able to see the dura. So this is the um, diagram, uh, again, showing how the ETOA uh, shows. So on the diagram on the right-hand side here, the um, uh, orange, orange um, uh, arrow shows the transcranial approach, which is from above. And the ETOA is actually from, the transorbital corridor is actually from uh, in front. So when we um, uh, dissect along the SOF, we're able to see the dura and we lift up the dura. So this is the, these are the structures that we're able to see. Here is the V1, the V2, which exits uh, the skull through the foramen rotundum and the V3 exits the skull through the uh, foramen ovale. And here is the MMA, uh, the foramen spinosa. And uh, here, going backwards, is the Meckel's tape. And here is the familiar GSPN, the uh, Gasserian ganglia, and the petrous bone. So this is a familiar view uh, that we see uh, from the middle fossa approach, uh, from the transcranial dissection. So this is actually of no difference uh, from what uh, we're able to achieve by doing an FTOZ. Of course, the uh, surgical freedom um, would be much greater uh, by the FTOZ approach, which is, which is more versatile. I personally um, still favors FTOZ for uh, different sorts of uh, big uh, meningiomas and lesions, but uh, for selected cases, this would actually be a very good minimalistic uh, corridor that offers similar uh, windows and exposure through the anteromedial triangle, the anterolateral triangle, and more. So here is what um, uh, I did with the cadaver dissection I'm going to share with you. So um, this is Michael's cave. This is the V1, V2, V3, as shown in the diagram. And um, going more medially and uh, superiorly, here is the um, uh, fourth nerve, the third nerve, and the ACP as well. So here again is the anteromedial triangle and the anterolateral triangle. A bit more medially, uh, by opening the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus between the V1 and the V2, um, here is the um, structures inside the cavernous sinus. We're able to see the um, cavernous portion of the carotid artery and the sixth nerve going um, uh, on the surface of it. And going more um, posterior, uh, this is the Dorado's canal. By lifting up the V1, we're able to see um, the uh, sixth nerve going all the way um, uh, into the cisternal part. So 
So when we drew the anterolateral triangle between V2 and V3, um, here's the view uh, that we are able to see. Uh, medially is the sphenoid sinus. This is the villain nerve, which is um, when we go from medially, endonasal approach, villain nerve is always the very uh, nice landmark for us to identify the carotid artery. So similarly, we're looking from lateral. From the lateral aspect, the uh, villian nerve also points to the petrous segment of the ICA, and uh, turning um, um, medially would be the lateral segment of the carotid artery. And that going upwards would be the paracaival uh, carotid artery. This is the eustachian tube, and uh, this is the lateral pterygoid plate after uh, the removal of the, uh, some of the uh, pterygoid muscles. So by doing more dissection, we're able to see the anterior trunk of the mandibular, mandibular nerve, which is uh, housed within the infratemporal fossa. So these are the different branches um, uh, that we're able to see uh, inside. I'm not going to name the, all the branches. Um, this is a, um, a photo that I extracted from the Fukushima dissection menu. Uh, of course, I love that. Uh, this is actually, if you, if you can appreciate, it's actually uh, the flip wheel, uh, the 180 uh, uh, flip wheel of the uh, view uh, from above. This is the view from the FTOC approach uh, by drilling the uh, V2 and V3 um, corridor. And this is what we're able to see from above. And so this is the direct um, uh, transorbital view, which is actually essentially the same. So if we take the uh, um, head for the CT um, after drilling, uh, this is the maximal um, uh, bone removal that uh, we are able to achieve. This is actually quite a lot, I would say, in a, in a real um, um, human cases and patients, I would um, uh, do um, uh, use a mat pour uh, to uh, fill back the space here to avoid uh, anathamos. But this is just to show you uh, how the, um, orbitotomy can be done and help with the um, access to different triangles and corridors with the skull base. And what's more, uh, by going um, posteriorly, uh, we are able to see the uh, Kawasis triangle, the Petrus apex, this is the GSPN, LSPN, cutting the MMA, um, uh, this is the temporal dura. So essentially, uh, this is um, similar to what we're able to achieve, to achieve uh, from uh, the drilling the Kawasis triangle, or by doing the transtericoid approach uh, from the endonasal approach. And we go immediately, again, um, uh, by removing the ACP, the anterior kind of process, uh, we're able to reach the um, orbital apex and uh, do the op uh, optic nerve decompression as well. So by, re by removing the ACP, uh, this is the, we're able to see the optic struct, um, again, familiar structures when we do um, the sections from above. And uh, by, re by removing this, this is a third nerve, this is the carotid artery, and this is the optic nerve. And what's more, and when we open the dura, um, the sylvan fissure, the carotid cistern, uh, can be seen. Uh, this is the um, um, uh, MCA, M1, um, M2, uh, both M2s, the insula, the A1, and um, going more medially, this is this uh, pituitary stalk, the optic nerve, the uh, posterior communicating artery, and the A1 as well. So this um, is actually a fantastic uh, uh, view um, uh, when we go um, anterior, that we're able to see the structures, not only the uh, skull base content, but also uh, in within the neurovascular structures as well. So um, you may question, are these just um, cataphoric dissections? Uh, you can do whatever you want, but um, as Walter said, this um, uh, technique has actually been utilized in the clinical cases already. Um, uh, since uh, 2017 or, or, or even a bit earlier. So there are different um, reports and a case series. Uh, my friend, uh, uh, Du Kong from Korea, he has um, nowadays um, accumulated more than 100 cases, uh, much more than I do. And um, um, his uh, series is fantastic as well. So um, actually I've mentioned uh, by the diagram that uh, the transorbital route is a, a lateral corridor to the uh, cavernous sinus. The medial corridor is actually um, uh, better uh, be done by the endonasal port. So um, 
uh, different groups have um, suggested and also have practiced by using a bipolar route uh, to deal with some uh, lesions uh, which are crosses both um, compartments, both the lateral and the medial compartment of the cavernous sinus. And I'm going to show you some cases as well afterwards. So um, with my experience, I would say ETOA transorbital approach, major indications include um, orbital tumors, vascular malformations within the orbit, um, sphenoid orbital meningiomas, which would, would be a good indication because um, uh, first of all, they often cause a proptosis. So correction by uh, direct um, anterior approach by transorbital would be very nice uh, to see the cosmetic um, outcome. And also that would enable a, a real, a genuine symptom one removal because uh, by uh, the transorbital approach, we, are, we have to um, go to the um, uh, dura attachment first. We have to open up the dura before uh, we tackle the meningioma. And by doing so, likewise, when we do extended transfer, um, extended endonasal approach uh, for um, plenum meningiomas, uh, we are often able to achieve uh, symptom one removal because the dura has to be resected um, at the same time. So this offers a, a great um, extent of resection. Trigeminal schwannomas, uh, selected cases, um, when they're situated over the uh, cavernous sinus, over the Meckel's cave, uh, they would be good indications. And of course, infratemporal fossil tumors, uh, which um, uh, I believe it's a very uh, good indication um, for using transorbital route. Because um, otherwise, you need an FDOZ approach, a big wound, a uh, uh, lot of bone work to approaches, sometimes just small tumors. Um, so this would be a, a very good approach. I, I love uh, transorbital, especially for infratemporal uh, fossil tumors. So the equipment that I use, um, they're uh, just a standard um, endoscopic endonasal um, um, equipment that I use, um, zero 30 degree endoscopes. Um, I love to use malleable instruments, uh, curved instruments. Um, they're very useful. I also practice the uh, chopstick uh, technique, uh, um, which I learned from uh, Professor Frolish, um, which is very good, especially uh, when we consider the uh, surgical corridor uh, with the endoscopic uh, transorbital approach is uh, sometimes narrow. Uh, so um, it's quite sometimes difficult to uh, have a uh, uh, two surgeons to work together. So uh, from my practice, um, I would say a lot of times I hold endoscope by myself and uh, I manipulate with uh, two instruments, suction and dissectors. Um, so um, um, apart from uh, neurosurgeons, I work closely with uh, oculoplastic surgeons uh, from uh, Hong Kong Eye Hospital, uh, which is the sister hospital of my hospital. Uh, I work closely with a uh, professor, uh, Hunter Yun, uh, very um, uh, uh, renowned um, uh, oculoplastic surgeon uh, in the oculoplastic field. Uh, so um, my first case actually started in a, uh, last year, and um, nowadays um, uh, we have uh, performed uh, around 15 uh, cases, and we have actually more uh, coming in the coming months as well. So just to recap, advantages of the transorbital approach, uh, less blood loss, small incision, uh, uh, no brain retraction uh, because we are uh, directly uh, attacking the lesion from uh, in front and below. So uh, essentially no brain retraction is uh, really required. Um, very low chance, I won't say no, but low chance of CSF leak versus endonasal approach. Uh, the reason is that for endonasal approach, uh, we have to go through different paranasal sinuses. Uh, of course, um, commonly would be the sphenoid sinus and the ethmoid sinus and sometimes the maxillary sinus. Um, when we um, um, uh, deal with lesions intracranially, we have to repair the skull base. Um, otherwise, the CSF would just go through the natural uh, sinuses uh, and leak through the nose. And this is, I would say, the major hurdle, apart from um, the um, um, uh, maneuverability, the visualization, or by menu, a dissection. The main hurdle uh, of um, an onasal approach is because of CSF leak. Um, uh, we have to use different top sorts of flaps, and uh, with that, uh, still um, we still uh, see cases of um, CSF leak. Uh, well, um, I do um, uh, um, use quite a lot of uh, um, extended endonasal approach as well. Um, well, uh, we're also publishing a series. It's quite good result with uh, our experience is less than less than five percent. Uh, but on the other hand, with a transorbital approach, because 
uh, there is actually no breaching of the paranasal sinus. So there is um, essentially very low chance of CSF leak. And by taking out the uh, endoscope, which I will show you uh, later with the um, operative videos, uh, the orbital content actually just bulges back. And it serves as a very natural uh, plug and a sealant uh, to uh, protect against um, the CSF leak. And by stitching up the um, uh, skin wound, uh, which is very um, uh, simple, I would say, um, there is essentially um, uh, no corridor for the CSF to escape. So uh, just around uh, three to four days, the uh, periobular swelling will subside and the chance of CSF leak is very minimal. And of course, avoiding atrophy of temporalis muscle because we don't do uh, large um, dissections, we don't do um, uh, skin incisions and um, uh, over the uh, temporalis muscle and uh, it can also avoid injury to the frontalis branch of the facial nerve and of course, as mentioned, better cosmetic outcome for proptosis correction because we are able to see directly at the um, at the eye, at the orbit. We're able to compare both sides when we're doing the uh, surgery. So that is a very good um, option, especially for sphenoorbital meningiomas. So enough uh, talking about the theory. So let's go directly to the uh, operative cases, which I hope uh, would be very interesting to you. So this actually is my first case, uh, a lateral sphenoid rich meningioma in a middle-aged lady uh, presented with proptosis and a blurring of vision uh, over the right eye, as you can see here, it's uh, uh, obviously proptotic. And uh, from the CT here, um, there is um, high prostosis, uh, which uh, pushes and bulges um, into the um, orbital content and pushes the orbit um, um, anteriorly. And, um, this is the orbital, uh, this is the operative video. It's a, it's not a very big um, meningioma, um, which um, I can better show over the um, operative video here. Okay, so this is the small um, meningioma, but a very small meningioma is already uh, enough to cause a very big uh, proptosis and um, high prostosis. So the red line here is uh, the traditional craniotomy wound, which is large and transorbital lid crease incision that we use uh, just follows the, the skin crease. So we use navigation as well. Um, uh, we used it uh, for every cases uh, to guide um, where we are. So this is the skin incision, uh, incision over the um, lid crease and the lateral orbital rim is exposed. We dissect the periorbital and we create the surgical corridor with the um, high-speed drill. So this is the um, um, uh, right side of the orbit, and uh, this is the hyperostotic bone that we see here. Um, we, first of all, we use a high-speed drill to drill off the uh, lateral part of the uh, hyperostosis. This is the temporalis muscle laterally that uh, is exposed um, from within. Uh, we actually use a diamond bird for most of the cases, but because of this um, very, um, um, uh, significant high prostosis for the um, inside core of it, we use the uh, cutting bird as you saw uh, for some part of it. We protect the periorbiter with the uh, silastic sheet. Uh, we use a silastic sheet for protection for first few cases, but uh, for the um, latest cases, we don't use it actually, it's okay. So this is the meningioma after we open up the dura, uh, we remove it by piecemeal. It's a very small uh, meningioma. This is the um, uh, temporal tip that we see. We do the hemostasis uh, with a surgical cell. We remove the remaining dura here and we um, control the um, um, bleeding of the dura by uh, bipolar coagulation. Hemostasis with surgical cell, we uh, put in a fat graft as well. And then finally, we repair the dura defect with um, uh, different sorts of um, um, a dura gen. Um, and we use fibrin glue to seal it off. And then again, we apply the fat graft and fibrin glue as well. And we check the hemostasis. And you see, actually, I would like to uh, replay this part here. When we withdraw the instruments, you can see that the orbital content actually um, bounces back into the field and it serves as a very good uh, natural uh, barrier to prevent CSF leak. So this is the post-op, uh, the cosmesis is very nice. This is the uh, extent of bone drilling that we have uh, performed. 
So the vision improved, uh, resolved the ptosis, proptosis, and um, improved uh, extraocular eye uh, movement. So this is the post-op. I see the patient at the um, um, clinic. <clears throat> you see the EOM, the extraocular eye movement is full. No proptosis, no diplopia, and there's no recurrence. So the second um, case that I'm going to show you is the orbital um, tumor, another good indication uh, for a transorbital route. Uh, for this case, we also use an ICG uh, to assist the uh, endoscopic excision. It's a 64-year-old um, uh, gentleman, uh, lady, I mean, uh, with a right um, blurring of vision. Uh, there is a, a RPD positive, and it's a small um, um, a cavernous hemangioma inside the um, orbital apex. So we do a similar incision, skin incision, decrease incision, and then uh, we drill the greater wing of sphenoid with the um, uh, diamond bird with the irrigation. And you see that uh, during the drilling, I put a suction there as well. I just hold uh, everything by myself. Um, this is the, uh, the uh, my um, assistant would uh, protect um, the um, periorbital content for me, uh, sometimes a co-surgeon with the uh, oculoplastic surgeon. And this is me holding the um, suction uh, together with the um, uh, drill. And so we drill the um, um, greater wing of sphenoid. This is the middle fossa dura. We remove the um, uh, sphenoid wing to create more space. So this is the um, periorbiter that we incise uh, with um, a knife and we cut it open. And then from now on, we inject the ICG. So ICG is very useful, especially in um, uh, these um, venous um, hemangioma cases, because um, without the ICG, we have um, difficulty sometimes in identifying which is the lesion and which is the rectus muscle, because they look uh, quite uh, similar uh, without um, any um, uh, ICG injection. So with the ICG injection, first of all, the lateral rectus muscle will enhance first. This is similar to uh, an MRI, and uh, the venous hemangioma, because it um, enhances at its venous phase, uh, it is um, identified with a delayed filling. So uh, this uh, discrepancy in the ICG filling enables us to identify and um, uh, dissect the tumor away from the um, uh, structures, for example, the uh, lateral rectus, and also the uh, superior division of the third nerve, which is often seen. Um, on the surface of the um, uh, hemangioma. So um, we are able to dissect uh, the lesion and we remove it on block. So when we dissect uh, medially, it's very important to see any um, um, ophthalmic um, artery, which is uh, sometimes adherent to the lesion. So with endoscope, a much magnified view, this is uh, much safer than uh, otherwise we do it in a microscopic view. So this is the post-op uh, CD brain. This is the case actually I show uh, that we remove the um, super, uh, super orbital rim. Um, uh, we played it back and the vision improved. You see, this is the, um, the post-op. Um, here the uh, incision is actually essentially very well sealed by the lid crease. This is another case of an orbital schwannoma. Again, orbital tumors uh, would be a good case uh, that we use uh, uh, endoscopic uh, transorbital uh, approach. Um, uh, this is the pre-op, a young lady uh, uh, with an orbital schwannoma with a proptosis. And after operation uh, on the right-hand side, um, the um, incision is, uh, this one we use a sub -brow incision uh, because of the size of the tumor. Uh, so after around uh, two months time, this is very uh, well sealed off and the patient is wearing eyeglasses. So it, uh, the spectacles actually uh, perfectly um, uh, serves as a camouflage. Uh, this is another uh, orbital uh, tumor. Um, this is um, called a hematic cyst. Um, patient presented with uh, proptosis, diplopia, similar procedure. Uh, we uh, drill off part of the um, a greater wing of sphenoid, we put an endoscope, uh, do some dissections, uh, open up the uh, periorbiter, and we see the lesion here under endoscope, again with um, uh, dissectors, forceps with um, colonoids to uh, do some dissection, and we're able to remove the lesion 
uh, after some uh, central default key. I'm going to skip this because interest of time. So this is another case um, that um, uh, we did, um, I think, around uh, two months ago. Uh, a gentleman presented with a six nerve palsy and um, a V2 distribution numbness. So we, um, this is the lesion here uh, over the left side. I just paused the video here. This is the um, a small uh, trigeminal uh, schwannoma. Um, of course, um, there are different options of approach. Uh, you can either do it um, from uh, traditional uh, craniotomy, or it can also be done via endonasal approach as well. Uh, but we, in this case, we picked an uh, endoscopic um, transorbital route uh, because um, uh, the um, fibers of the uh, V2 uh, can be uh, visualized in a better fashion. And they're actually crossing the tumor over the medial side when we look at the uh, cyst uh, sequence. So this is the view again, familiar view. We drill the um, sphenoid wing, the greater wing of sphenoid, uh, and then uh, we uh, incise through the um, uh, manacle orbital band. And then we use the blunt dissector. You see the uh, peeling of the middle uh, fossa dura away from the uh, periorbiter. And uh, by doing this, we're able to enter the uh, entrance of the um, cavernous sinus. Uh, which um, is actually occupied by the tumor itself. So we first uh, cauterize the surface of the um, schwannoma, which um, can be vascular. And then we use a suction for debulking. It is soft. Uh, we can, uh, we already know it uh, from the pre-op uh, MRI. So again, we use um, different um, dissectors to dissect the nerve fibers. You can see here. And then uh, we use the cotton oil to protect the cavernous sinus more. Uh, if we enter the correct plane, um, actually the uh, venous bleeding of the, from the cavernous sinus is very minimal. It's the same um, for um, a transcranial approach at that session. If you enter the correct plane, the venous bleeding from the cavernous sinus is minimal. For this case, I didn't use any flow seal. Um, I just uh, put in a small piece of surgical and then the uh, small woozing actually stopped. And with an uh, endoscopic view, uh, the um, uh, plane can be entered in a perfect manner. So this is a small uh, disease and nerve um, from the V2, which uh, we divided it, and then we did a further lesion. So this is a very nice uh, pulsation um, from the macroscape. And then the reconstruction, we put in um, uh, Duragen, we put in Surgicil, uh, and then um, uh, we put in fibrin glue as well. So you might have noticed for this case, I actually didn't uh, use any elastic sheets. And so this is the wound that we stitch it up uh, by two layers and post-op well, uh, resolved um, six nerve palsy and uh, no more numbness. Another case of uh, infra um, uh, orbital schwannoma, this is more, um, uh, inferior lesion. This is actually infratemporal fossa. Uh, we use an um, uh, inferior conjunctival uh, approach, um, and then the tumor is seen within the um, um, uh, maxillary sinus. This is a case that we done, uh, I think, last month. So this is the um, content within the tumor. Uh, again, this is a uh, schwannoma, so this is typical appearance. We use a uh, curved um, and uh, suction and uh, malleable instruments to do internal debulking and the section. We're able to see the infraorbital nerve, which is a uh, very nice. And then we, this case, we also use a 45 degree endoscope uh, to view the anterior wall. There, again, there has been discussion whether um, cobalt lock approach uh, would be feasible as well. Yes, uh, but then uh, because um, for transorbital, uh, we actually address um, directly um, uh, to the uh, infraorbital uh, nerve first. So the um, nerve preservation would be better. And because the uh, larger defect here, we repair the orbital floor with a titanium plate. And then um, this is their um, closure of the wound. So post-op, um, the uh, um, infraorbital nerve and numbness um, actually reduced. This is the pre-op area of numbness. 
numbness. And the post-op numbness actually just uh, reduced to the small part. Um, it's a post-op uh, one week. So you see the this is uh, um, uh, very common. Uh, post-op, there is some um, uh, periorbital swelling and eye redness. Um, but then uh, the conjunctival uh, injection usually resolves uh, within two weeks' time. Um, I'm going to skip this. This is essentially a case of a recurring uh, pituitary tumor at the infratemporal fossa. Uh, we use a subbrow incision. Um, uh, we identify the uh, V2 and the V3. This is the V3. Um, we put endoscope um, um, uh, point downwards and we're able to um, remove the uh, pituitary tumor along the V3. Yeah, this is the V3 here. Okay, so it's a very nice uh, window. This is a uh, medial where it's looking downwards. So that was looking medial. So we're um, going in again. And this time I believe we're going to see the V2. Yeah, so this is the V2. Okay, so this is the antero lateral triangle, V2 and V3. So this is um, where the tumor is. So again, there is a, this case, there is no um, CSF leak and we just uh, put in some surgery cell for hemostasis. Um, skip this one. Again, it's an infratemporal fossa lesion. Uh, very good approach uh, with the transorbital uh, route uh, to see the antral lateral triangle and the antral medial triangle. This is a, a case that we do um, together with ENT surgeons, a bipolar approach. Uh, this is a dumbbell shaped um, uh, schwannoma arising from the um, 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 trigeminal nerve. Uh, we use, uh, first of all, the endoscopic um, transorbital route. We do a tumor debulking. And then afterwards, uh, we put endoscope uh, from below as well uh, through the anonasal route, transmaxillary sinus um, uh, route uh, that we're able to see actually from below. Um, we're able to see the um, uh, uppermost part of the tumor. And uh, we're able to dissect um, the um, V2 uh, away from the tumor capsule. So this is a bipodal um, uh, application of a transorbital um, uh, uh, excision. So the major branches of the fifth nerve are preserved and the patient uh, does well afterwards. So this is uh, the post-op. Um, I often like to use this um, um, photo to ask uh, my trainees, which side is the operated side? It's hard to tell, right? So uh, the last case, I don't have a video here, but this is a um, case that we're also uh, doing publication in this. I believe this is uh, probably the first case um, that has been described uh, using uh, transorbital, um, endonasal, and also combined um, with um, the um, transoral uh, uh, routes using a robotic um, uh, system by Da Vinci system. We do it with um, ENT surgeons as well. This is a case of a parapharyngeal liposarcoma. So the red arrow is the um, transorbital, the um, uh, orange-ish, um, uh, yellowish is the endonasal. And because the extent of the tumor, uh, inferiorly, uh, this is uh, the blue arrow is the transoral uh, port. We're able to remove and resect this tumor on block. It's not um, um, a piecemeal uh, resection, which is very essential for um, oncological carriers and the patient as well. So um, sorry, a bit of the overrun. Um, so in summary, uh, this is um, ETO is a direct anterior approach to the orbital apex and skull based pathologies, lateral to the cavernous sinus and also at the um, infratemporal fossa. I would like to stress that collaboration among neurosurgeons and oculoplastic surgeons are essential, especially for a difficult um, uh, way of access, um, uh, as this is a MIS in nature, possibilities, uh, possibilities of combined bipodal or even tripodal surgeries are feasible. And of course, uh, before you want to start, um, if you're not so experienced, I would say training and cadaveric the session in the lab uh, is uh, very useful, especially for neurosurgeons, particularly the transorbital uh, window we're not very familiar with. So I'd like to thank my team. Um, uh, ben, I've mentioned, uh, fantastic videos. Thank you very much for the editing and a good uh, working partner, uh, Dr. Jay and uh, Dr. Zheng. Uh, Dr. Zheng is our um, chief of service, very supportive of um, 
uh, of um, innovative um, ideas and uh, new minimum invasive approaches. And Dr. Jay is a very experienced um, neurosurgeon as well uh, for um, uh, working partner. And of course, my partners, uh, ophthalmologists, uh, Professor Yoon and his team. Um, this is Professor Yoon. Um, we work together in a lot of cases. So um, just uh, like to spend the last 10 seconds uh, to um, uh, um, has an advertisement time. This is the uh, Hong Kong Neurosurgical Society uh, annual scientific meeting. Um, uh, we have it every year. Last year, we are honored to have um, Walter to be one of our guest uh, speaker. Uh, this, uh, we have a different uh, theme uh, uh, each year. This uh, year, the theme is on a TBI, uh, not skull base, um, and neurocritical care. We uh, invited uh, different um, international speakers, including um, uh, world famous uh, Professor Hutchison, and, uh, and Mark Bosen, and um, and a lot more. Um, uh, the ASM is going to be held in November, and uh, it's going to be hybrid, so it'll be online. So feel free to sign up and join as well. So hope after COVID, I will be able to see everyone in Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Very nice picture at the end there on the left corner. You can see that behind my background there. This this one, however, I took myself. Um, to 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 sum up, uh, it, it's it's so nice that, uh, to to hear that talk, Calvin. That it was a tour de force. Um, just you know, Marco is here. Just like the Italian took major uh, contributions to the endonasal route through uh, uh, Dr. Capabianca's group in Napoli and, and others, it, it, it wouldn't be wonderful that the, the Koreans and the, and, and the Chinese and, and the and the Asians take a major role in advancing uh, uh, endo orbital and endo. Um, uh, transorbital approaches. I do have a couple of comments though. Uh, the placement of the endoscope is very critical. You said that it very, gets very crowded to have someone else hold the endoscope. Uh, and, and I've tried that and it's certainly true. Whereas at the endonasal route, you, you have a little bit more room for that uh, holder. Do you ever use a scope holder? And by the way, that chopstick technique for people who don't know what that means, by the way, learning chopsticks technique from a Frenchman is rather ironic for a Chinese guy. Um, <laughs> The, the left hand is on the endoscope and on the suction and the dissector is on the right hand. Of course, you change it if you're left-handed. I often find that problem is that the camera is extremely heavy and I, I can't stabilize the camera and the suction together. What, what is the trick? Now, may I uh, just show it here? Well, um, so this is something that I just uh, get from my, <laughs> from my desk. So imagine, um, I just, um, so imagine this is the endoscope. So this is the, this is the instruments that I use, okay. Like this, okay. So I can, I were able to use um, the a technique by moving my different fingers. So it's like a dual pincer. It's like a dual pincer. So this is the suction, and uh, sometimes this is the um, uh, dissector and um, or the forceps. So by doing this, and by uh, and actually I can rotate, and I can put in and out, and in and out as well. So um, this is very okay. Useful. You're you're making it look easy, but it's really not, right? You, you, the the, the non dominant hand is on the endoscope, and that's uh, that the only thing in the non dominant hand. So that's not that easy. I personally am using the microscope for a lot of this, be, simply because of that problem uh, and the placement of that scope. Uh, and uh, maybe someday I'll learn how to use a scope holder. And I have an exoscope. I'm going to try that out a little bit. Um, uh, any visual complications that you've seen? Um, Fuzzy vision, blurry vision, double vision. Yes, um, there is one case of uh, suffering from um, orbital apex syndrome. Um, the um, patient um, is a, a young gentleman with um, uh, quite a large um, uh, trigeminal schwannomas. Um, I believe that there is uh, some retraction um, towards the orbital apex, but luckily uh, the patient's uh, post op the patient's vision actually dropped. Um, that was quite worrying actually uh, with ptosis as well. And uh, after around six weeks time, um, the um, vision is almost back to normal. And um, there is um, uh, resolving, uh, actually total resolved of the uh, ptosis and also the restricted in the um, uh, EOM as well after around uh, four weeks time. So I think the lesson to learn is uh, remember to um, incise the MOB, the manacle orbital band, so as to dissect and free the um, uh, middle fossa dura from the periorbita. Otherwise, when we do the dissection and retraction, actually the traction, the force will transmit directly to the um, uh, orbital apex. And by but, doing the but, retraction, we have to uh, do the intermittent um, uh, relaxation and also to check the pill pose from time to time, say around maybe 15 or 10 minutes, we have to check the pill pose and to take everyone, everything out. So by just checking a few seconds, it's actually relieving the pressure. 
Okay, so pre pressure relief so that you don't get visual complications, but visual complications are rare. Okay, yeah. now I, I try to publish a video about doing a GBM through through this, uh, and other people are doing intraaxial tumors as well. I got yelled at by the reviewer uh, for even <laughs> trying anything doing intra. And what is the what is the indication for using this for intraaxial lesions or temporal lobe? Um, I'm almost ready to clip an aneurysm with this um, of the MCA. Um, is that crazy? What is your view about intraaxial lesions? Well, um, personally, I'm, I might uh, sound crazy by doing the endoscopic transorbital, but um, I would um, be very cautious about um, uh, doing, I would say, heroic uh, stuff because patient outcome matters most. Uh, because by, by clipping an aneurysm, uh, it can be done perfectly by um, uh, a transcranial or even a keyhole approach uh, or a supraorbital. And uh, that would have minimal uh, complications. And um, if everything goes smooth, it's fine by transorbital. Uh, but if there is a bleeding, intra rupture, uh, the, the, the view can be really contaminated and the control of the intra rupture can be disastrous. So personally, I am still way far from uh, clipping an aneurysm uh, by transorbital. Uh, Intraxial lesions, yes, so that would be a good indication for especially um, mesial temporal sclerosis or small um, cathinomas or small gliomas within the medial temporal lobe because it's a direct uh, trajectory uh, medial, and um, that is a good approach. Uh, GBMs, again, um, the um, really depends on the lesion. If it's a small lesion, it's fine, but if it's a large lesion, um, I also do awake craniotomy, so obviously patient cannot stay awake with a transfer. Um, so I think the indication um, depends on the on, on your experience, expertise with Walter's expertise. I think it's fine, but uh, with others, um, the good indications would be again orbital tumors, trigeminal schwannomas, um, uh, infratemporal lesions, um, uh, and sphenoorbital meningiomas. All right. So I think we're out of time. I'll hand it over to Marco and Professor Basso. Uh, wonderful talk, Calvin. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you. One question. Can I ask one question? It was a great talk. Just uh, uh, comments only. Say you showed a, a case where you have put a, a sub eyebrow incision. Why can't you put an eyebrow incision? Because after that, the scar won't be seen at all. And uh, do you do uh, keep tarsorapy postoperatively for a few days or no tarsorapy at all? And other questions which I wanted to ask, I think Walter had asked morbidity to the eye. Uh, but these two questions, why, why can't you just make an eyebrow incision? Okay, so quick answer. Um, uh, first, uh, the eyebrow incision is very familiar with neurosurgeons, but uh, the answer is uh, it's quite actually far away uh, from, the, from the orbit. So from the eyebrow incision, you need a great uh, pull down of the, of the, of the, of the skin. Uh, and to, the, to reach the um, orbital rim. And that actually will cause uh, extra pressure to the orbital content. So an obvious alternative is to do an incision over the lid crease. And there are actually a lot more incisions that we can use. Uh, but for neurosurgeons, if you want to try the first case, a subbrow that is uh, just uh, beneath the, the eyebrow, which is a bit lower uh, over the orbital rim would be a good choice. Second, uh, simple answer, I don't do tassography uh, at all because it's, it's not um, uh, essential because after the surgery, the patient um, uh, doesn't have any um, um, a corneal problem, doesn't have any um, visual problem. So I, I don't see the need to do any tassography. The patient actually usually just discharge around the day two. Thank you, Calvin. Great talk. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Suresh. Can I say something? Yes, Professor Armando Vaso, please. No, no. Only having a, a lot of experience with orbital tumors because I had been working in, in Buenos Aires in uh, also in a very uh, large hospital, ophthalmological hospital. We have a lot of experience in orbital and paraorbital tumors, etc. So first of all, I would like to congratulate Dr. Calvin Mack for these tremendous and uh, new approaches, endoscopical approach because we have experience with a, a microsurgical approach, of course, lateral approach, Berke approach, a, a, a trans elbow also, and, and every, every microsurgical, microsurgical approaches. Just a question, how long does it take for you uh, a, a, a endoscopical approach of all this pathology? Maybe it's take longer or, or, or shorter than the microsurgical one. Well, Just thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Basso. It's very um, 
um, uh, my honor indeed uh, to, to hear the compliment and receive compliment from you. Um, uh, so um, the operative time is actually comparable. Um, I won't say it's a bit, I, I won't say it's shorter, uh, but it's comparable. Say, for example, for the um, sphenoid orbital meningiomas uh, that we do, uh, it takes around uh, three to four hours. So it's uh, comparable to um, open approach. Um, uh, if you consider the drilling, the uh, dura repair, et cetera. So it's kind of comparable. Uh, the blood loss is um, similar. Um, it's actually less, I would say. It's around just um, uh, 100 mils uh, usually uh, because the bone work and the uh, 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 required is, is much less. And uh, yes, uh, I'd just like to write on the point addressed uh, by Professor Basso is that um, uh, for neurosurgeons who want to uh, use transorbital approach, um, microsurgical skills are very important. So um, I, I actually still do a lot of the uh, open approaches, FTOCs, um, uh, Kawasis, uh, combined proposals, et cetera. Uh, the microsurgical um, skills and the microsurgical um, understanding of the anatomy is very important before you um, move on to endoscope. So it's not an um, uh, endoscope and a normal microscope. It's not my style. I do everything. Oh, thank you. And congratulations again because it's an advance. It's, it's like a pituitary surgery. You know, now endoscopically is better than the microscopic, or combines the two anyway, in some cases. But anyway, congratulations. Thank I you. Will, maybe I will invite you to, to say something with, with one of my uh, the former assistants, now is the chief of service of that of um, ophthalmological hospital. Maybe they would like to, to hear you with your presentation. That's Thank my you. Honor indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We had a wonderful session on all I can say is just wow. Wow. I am short of words to compliment you, Professor Calvin Mack. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, would you be staying back for the second lecture, Professor Calvin Mack? Sure, of course. Yes, I understand Professor Walter Jean has scheduled a surgery, so he has to leave. Thank you very much, Professor Walter Jean, for joining in. Before we move on to the second session, I would like to thank Professor Shubin, who has arranged a special broadcast on WeChat in China. And we are broadcasting this on YouTube, Zoom, and WeChat, of course. And we have currently 1,450 audiences who have joined us live. So with that, I would like to move on to the second session and invite Professor Marco Fontanella to say a short introduction and would in turn invite Professor Armando Basso. Professor Fontanella. Thank you for the invitation uh, and my best compliment uh, to uh, Professor Mack, a beautiful speech. For me, it's very simple, very simple duty because uh, everyone, every neurosurgeon in the world knows uh, Professor Basso. <laughs> that uh, is one of the master of, was and is one of the master of neurosurgery. Uh, he was president of the Argentinian uh, uh, Neurosurgical Society. He was president, uh, I think in uh, 1994 is right, uh, of the uh, World Federation of, of Neurological Surgeons uh, Societies. And uh, is a, a really a huge experience uh, of uh, any kind of surgery, but uh, uh, in this case of pituitary surgery. Uh, we, in Italy, with Professor Capabianca and uh, others, uh, we perform a, a lot of uh, endoscopic uh, uh, pituitary surgery. And uh, as uh, uh, is, was mentioned before, uh, we, uh, to perform this kind of surgery, we should be a team start from the lab, so with the anatomist, the lab is uh, always our first step, and, and then uh, uh, collaboration with the, in the surgeons, uh, ophthalmologists, uh, and uh, radiologists, uh, and so on, but uh, of course uh, we have to work together. So I'm very, very pleased to, to introduce you, uh, Professor Basso, and uh, I know that he's a young neurosurgeon. I think uh, in uh, the beginning of October is his is birthday, and uh, and uh, everyone is uh, waiting for uh, the, another speech of Professor Basso and uh, to 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 join uh, his experience. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Frontanella, for this uh, nice presentation. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure for me your presentation on, 
and, 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 and even because because I came, I'm from Italian origin also. <laughs> so, <laughs> so as you as you know. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank. Uh, I would like to thank the, the invitation of Professor Professor Gatto, Professor Raja, and and uh, for this invitation to give that talk historical historical. I'm sorry, it's a little bit boring, but uh, for the young generation, is is important to know the history also. And thank you to the the Asian Congress of uh, of Neurological Surgeon. Uh, uh, invite me for this presentation. Okay, thank you very much. So the the title of this presentation is uh, uh, is what we learn after uh, after this uh, more than three three thousand and five hundred uh, you know uh, pituitary tumors uh, treatment the history present and future. But the the idea for the young generation is uh, is to know something. Uh, the, the concerning the history because uh, this is practically my personal history concerning neurosurgery because I start at the end of the 50s and, uh, and, and uh, exactly in, in the in the 60s so uh, this is this is the uh, hospital this is the Buenos Aires where where I'm I'm emeritus professor now I'm one of my 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 pupil is the is the chief of the department of neurosurgery professor Sokolovsky. this is the institute of neurosurgery in the in the university of buenos aires just in front of this hospital and this is the hospital foch in paris where i trained for many years there and i work for many years with my dear teacher Professor Professor Gerard Gerard Guillot. So the history starts in 1960. Do you know what uh, what 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 we have in the in, in 1960 when I when when I start? You know? The diagnosis of pituitary adenoma was just clinical or ophthalmological or simple radiology, and the treatment was of course just transcranial surgery and pathology hematoxylins and, and eosin. But now in, 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 in 2021, the diagnosis, of course, is much more simple. Every, every, everything is much more simple. The clinical diagnosis with radioimmunoassay, ophthalmological, you know, all, all these possibilities that, that we have uh, uh, for the ophthalmological diagnosis. And, and the images are, uh, you know, X-ray, CT scan, MRI, all its sequences and forms, and the treatment in now, now in 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 in, in 2021, it's uh, first of all I recognize endoscopic treatment, transphenoidal when 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 is necessary, transcranial when is necessary, or in some cases radiosurgery. Uh, and, and the clinical treatment, of course, now we have DOPA agonists, analog DOPA agonists, mainly for plaquinomas, uh, analog for, 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 uh, um, for acromegaly and, and new molecules, and the pathology, of course, immunohistochemistry and markers, etc. So how we got here that this is very important to, to know the, 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 the history of thing, surgery. Well, of course, the inferior uh, approach of the Cella Tursica, the historical landmarks, uh, just, just the most important, in my opinion, of course, let me, let me move this. That I, the, in my opinion, of course, is the, in, 19, in 1907, the transphenoidal uh, approach by Schleffer in Vienna. The end on, in, 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 in 07, the, we celebrate in Vienna the, the, hundred, the, the hundred years of uh, Schleffer's transphenoidal approach. And in 1910, the endonasal transphenoidal approach by Hirsch was uh, an otolaryngologist, and his he approach, in my opinion, what was, was much more interesting even than the Cushing approach. But you know, the sublabial transphenoidal approach by Cushing was the more expanded around the world because the prestigious of the master is uh, was uh, absolutely more more important. So, oh, uh, excuse me, uh, happened. 
Okay, so this is this is in reality the Schleffer was a transfacial approach, very complicated, even yeah, and in that time without without antibiotic and all and all the correct diagnosis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, the result was not not very not not very interesting and and when with exist. Uh, so and Oscar Skilch in 1910. This is very important because is the is the lateral septal uh, submucosal approach just in that year with the preservation of the septum. This is this is this is really very important. And uh, and, uh, and I applied this this technique, uh, uh, you know, 60 years after Hirsch because in my opinion was very important. But uh, as I said before. With the prestige of Cushing, the sublabial transrenoceptal transfedoidal approach in 1911 was the most re expanded around the world because just Cushing said that. So everybody went immediately to, to try to do this. In my country, in Argentina, a, 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 a otorino laryngologist from the professor Eliseo Segura. Um, uh, perform uh, a lot of patients with the Cushing with no very, 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 very good result according to the history. He wrote that book in that time, the treatment of uh, for tumores de la hypophysis, tumor, uh, the words by Eliseo Segura. But this, uh, this, uh, you know, this approach didn't, didn't, uh, didn't was did not expand. To other surgeons for many, for many, for so many years. Why? Because you know, in, in 1924, um, uh, Walter Dandy, the most popular and, and, in my opinion, the best surgeon of that era, uh, he said, with a tremendous mistake, the nasal root is impractical and can never be otherwise. You know. A big professor can uh, can uh, you know has uh, have uh, uh, and produced big mistake also, and he recommended recommended to came back to subfrontal approach, as, as as you see here, and of course he convinced even even uh, uh, um, even um, uh, Professor Cushing, and, and and Cushing you know recommend to. Every, every, uh, to all his trainees and the whole uh, neurosurgical community in, in those years was uh, absolutely forbidden to perform the, the transfedoidal approach. But in Edinburgh, one of his uh, former trainees, Norman Dodd, Norman Dodd in, in, the, in the 40s and 50s, he continued. Uh, with the with the with the transphenoidal approach, with the with the Cushing technique, and my master Gerard Guillot, uh, he went to Edinburgh in the in the fifties, and uh, and he came in back to Paris. He introduced uh, to help the to, to to help his surgery the fluoroscopic intraoperative control by Gerard Guillot, and that was the the, the way I, I learned with him. That was that was the possibility of diagnosis in the 50s, as you can see here, just normal normal uh, uh, X-ray uh, uh, profile or or whatever, and in some cases, you know, the introduction uh, the the introduction of of air and uh, determine the double flow of the the double flow of the cell like here, and with the cisternography, it was where it was possible. To, to determine the limits of the uh, or the extension of, of the tumor. You know, the armamentarium of Gio was really very simple, very, very simple. You know, uh, uh, you know dissectors, and this and this cricket to expand the light retractor. Light retractor really was very interesting. And you know, in those years, as you can see here, in 58, Gio. Uh, published this, this book, and this book came to my hands because I, I started neurosurgery uh, just as a doctor in in in, in 1960. In, in, in 1962, and I said was fantastic this, this this approach. And even in Buenos Aires, I start to perform. This is me operating operating in a semi sitting position, drilling 
with the with the light retractor, as you see here. But of course, it was not very simple to 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 see and dissect, etc. At the end of the of the dark corridor, you know, and with the you know, it was necessary to clean the the retractor, etc., etc., etc. Anyway, I was very 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 with very lucky when I, I asked Professor Bio is, is he, he could have me, uh, uh, have me in Paris in his service and then he accepted me for some months and I, then I spent with him many, 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 many years. You know, it was the classical Cushing sublarial trans rhinoceptal transferoidal approach. What does? That was, you know, that uh, the, the sublabial incision, the resection in some cases of the spine, the spine of the, of the, of, of the nose, that uh, some complication, teeth complication, and, and, and then the complete resection of the, of, of the septum. That was, that was the way as, as Cushing determined in his, uh, in his uh, 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 technique. So with this technique, I, I start uh, in Paris and, and looking, looking the technique of you. But I have the chance in Paris to meet Jules Hardy, as a, because Hardy uh, trained with we also in, in, in 63 and 64. When I, when I arrived in, in 65, I met uh, Jules and became very close friends and he invited me to, to, to Montreal, because it, you know the contribution of, of uh, Hardy was fundamental because he used a microscope. In 65, you know, something happened in the history of neurosurgery because in one, in one place, uh, uh, Yashargil in Zurich came in back from Vermont. Uh, we learned with, with Professor Donaghy in Vermont. And, uh, and of course, the microscope became uh, very well known for, for the, for the otorhinolaryngologists, otologists, etc., but not for neurosurgeons. So, of course, uh, but the, the, the introduction of microscope by Jules, he, he, he discovered the microadenoma in normal pituitary glands, but the microadenoma producing, you know, very important disease. Amenorrhea, galactorrhea, infertility, prolactinoma, you know, uh, microadenoma producing growth hormone, acromegaly, gigantism, etc. And of course, the terrible Cushing disease that you, that you, that you all know. So his contribution was really a, a very fantastic contribution. That's why Jules is, is, uh, has a tremendous, you know, advance in the history of the, the, the pituitary surgery and the pituitary treatment of all the disease. In, the, in 1907 and, seven and, and 70, you know, we introduced, we uh, the, were introduced, uh, and for neurosurgeons also, the radio immunoassay. That's, that's that, that, you know, allow us to, uh, to determine the hormonal classification of pituitary adenoma. From then on, we start to know that, that ACTH producing, producing a, the hormone and was the responsible for the, for the Cushing disease. Somatotron GH producing the responsible of the, of the gigantism and, uh, and, and, <coughs> and acromegaly, tyrotropic, lactotropic, the prolactinomas, infertility, functional and non-functional that now we know that the, the non-functional and are not really non-functional because produce gonadotrophic subunits and new cell adenomas, oncocytomas, et cetera. So in, in, in my country, coming back in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the 70s uh, around, we start to, we were, we were in, in, in my country, and in South America, the first to use the, the endoscope, the, 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 the microscope, and the first two have an enormous experience, uh, enormous experience in, in, in pituitary adenomas. And my, my pathologist, this is, this is the classification of IOR, on, you know, uh, no classification, but pertain, pertains a percentage of different uh, kind of tumor. 
somatotropic in my, in my series of more than a thousand cases at that time uh, represent the 12% product genomas 22, mixed tumor, GA uh, product genomas uh, 16%, corticotropic 14, and non-functional 20% of all patients. That was a very important, you know, very important uh, uh, information information for, 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 for us. Um, so that was in the, in the 80s, you know, in the 70s and 80s, the way to operate the, what we call the Jules Hardy microsurgical approach with a, with a radiological intra, intraoperative control. That, that was the, I will show you the, my personal advance with different technique along, along, the, along the years. So you see in those, in those years, I published, you know, uh, very uh, important papers because was, uh, um, you know, was very, was new information for the, for the international literature on, on the, you know, acromegalic syndrome, epitutis, aprolactin, and, and, Cushing, and, 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 Cushing, and Cushing disease, and many conferences in South, and, uh, South Americans and, uh, and around the world. But in 87, we passed, we, we came again to, as I said before, to the endonasal lateral septal transphenoidal approach by Hears. Why? Because it, that, that, that uh, technique uh, of Hears, which is also a submucosal dissection with septum preservation and turbidite preservation, preserve the normal anatomy of the node, which is, which is really very, very, very important, you know, that we all know that even now with the, with the, with the endoscopical approach, we have to remove the septum, we have to remove the turbinate to, to approach endoscopically. So when it's not necessary for, for really a, a, a small, a small pituitary tumors and going directly to the cella turcica, the endonasal lateral septal transferoidal approach, microsurgical approach, continue to be uh, uh, interesting and useful. And this is this is a, 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 an old, you know, an old video you can see here. But for the new generation, this is history, you know, uh, that the, the the dissection with the, with the, the dissection of the of the of the lateral uh, wall of the of the septum just here preservation of the preservation of the mucosa uh, going going i don't know to bore you with all those things but just to know how how is the how is the the historical historical things you know and then and we, and then we displace the just the septum and we arise very easily with every preservation of the anatomy of the nose to the uh, sphenoidal, sphenoidal rostrum. And you see here, you know, open the dura, remove the tumor with a little piece of septum uh, uh, just uh, to close the, the cella. And then we use for many, many years, and even until today, you know, cyanoacrylate to preserve, uh, to preserve in small tumor the, the possibility possibility of uh, of leaks so and then and then of course uh, moving moving on in uh, in the 90s we start with the transnasal approach uh, described by my my dear friend and a tremendous professor uh, in mainly in neurosurgery and and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, neuros neurosurgical anatomy, which is very important, Albert Rotten. And, and, and with endoscopic assistance in those, in, in those years. This is, this is the way going directly to, 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 the, to, you know, the, the, to the sphenoidal sinus with the displacement of, of course of the septum, but preservation preservation of the septum. This is the, the rotten retractor, was, was very useful, a little bit longer than the others, the, the, the normal retractor, just to arrive to the, to the rostrum of the sphenoidal. And then, of course, the, the remotion of the tumor and using, the, and using at the same time, the one, one the cella is open, 
we introduced the we the, we introduced the endoscope, the endoscope to check you know the anatomy of the sphenoidal sinus and all and all, all the you know the the the, the different possibilities uh, that we can have there, and then and then we once once the once uh, that that part doing we continue we continue with a microscope remotion remove the tumor as usual of course and then at the at the at the very end instead i remember that we we all we use a mirror to go there and to see if some a part of the tumor uh, has been has left behind but with the endoscope was very, 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 very useful. We went there, and then I went for instance, in this case, we discovered a little hole in the roof of the of the of the of the cellar. This is the this is the normal pituitary preserve. But this was this that was better than the endoscope, better than the than the mirror, because we we should pay attention in closing in closing using fat, etc. To preserve, uh, to preserve the, the the leak. So then, of course, he, here you can you can see in this in this the way uh, this this is me so in in those years with the microscope. Then then we went we went to to the the, the endoscopica endoscopica. This is this is now one of my assistants, but now is Professor uh, uh, Abati. Which is the, the 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 best you know now endoscopic like neurosurgeon in 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 Buenos Aires. But in those years, he helped me with this possibility. Uh, again, drilling, drilling, again. Uh, well, you all know this 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 historical technique, historical and, and, and in some cases, uh, actual even, you know. Because not 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 in, in not in every place in the world people have experienced endoscopical experience. That was, you know, the 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 the, the way the way. In this case, for instance, we we discovered that that a part of the tumor here had been left left behind. We went again. We removed the the, the we removed the whole thing, and here the end of the surgery, the pituitary preserve. Etc. 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 So that was that was the, the 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 way we for many years we we do we 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 perform the pituitary surgery. This is uh, this the image that you know very well of the of the of the endoscope of the endoscope. And and he, no 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 excuse me I'm coming back. And he and here is now. Uh, this uh, my, my my former assistant Santiago Abati, which is which is uh, the person that in our in our uh, um, department I, I I continue to to go there uh, two times in a week, and I like to talk with the with the residents with the young people to show them. And this is this is uh, Santiago Abati. Doing with the endoscopical technique, the, prepara the preparation of the ADAT flap, which is ADAT flap. You know that ADAT discovered is a, is a, is a otorhinolaryngologist from, from Argentina, from Rosario, and he has the tremendous idea of the vascularizes, uh, uh, you know, flap to close the cella when, when the remotion is open. Like in this case, uh, Santiago is doing. You know that was a, 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 a very large tumor, so it was necessary, and this is possible with the endoscope. That that what I that what I say that uh, we start and uh, we start uh, starting in in 2013. The, in, in our department in the University Hospital, you completely. Uh, uh, Practically, all, all pituitary surgery are made endoscopically, and not only Santiago, but the other, the other, the other young doctors uh, of the department also. So you you see this big tumor has been completely removed, and uh, of course one will remove because the planum has been opened, 
to go up, to go to go up was it was necessary of course to close and this is and this is the way uh, he he closed uh, completely with uh, with muscle with uh, with the sp sponge sponge fat you know the clothes and and then in in in, in many cases the the, fl the flap at at the end and of course and of course as you as you well know the the glue to to close completely well this is this is this is the way uh, the actual way so you see we have we have made a long a long uh, 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 way from Schleffer to to uh, uh, Abati in my country, passing for all our experience in things. This is this is uh, the result of that of that case pre pre and post surgery. The removal endoscopically, of course, was was perfect. But of course, I have to pay tribute to my master because your in 1962 in Paris. He was the first person in the history who uh, who utilized an endoscope for a pituitary tumor. Of course, of course, you know the the and, and was he made an endo and radioscopic intraoperative control in that way with this primitive X-ray X-ray. Uh, X-ray uh, apparatus, the otorino-laryngologist in this in this in this uh, surgery uh, make the, the approach, and then Professor Bio. This is the image, of course, are very primitive. But I remember that it was in 1960, 62. So this is this is this is a, a pioneer. Of course, Bio after the microscope there was. Arrived, he left, left behind the endoscope, and he was the first to do this in, 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 in neurosurgery. So, is the microscope still necessary in pituitary tumors? That was the work that one of my one of my uh, pupil, also Alvaro Campero, uh, which is now a, a fantastic uh, a neurosurgeon uh, in Argentina, very well known all over the world, Alvaro. So, so we we went to the to the literature, and this is this is a, a, a paper. I, I have so many. I don't want to lose time for this. But in conclusion, the same sergeant he said that uh, of course the uh, the the endoscopic transfenoidal surgery for functional pituitary tumor led to be a better endocrinological outcome for non-invasive macroadenomas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However. Morbidity with the endoscopic technique was high in terms of, of rate of the rate of postoperative CSF leak. But my personal opinion that with all those uh, new techniques for closing the, the not only the cella but the anterior skull base, now this problem is practically is practically solved. solved. So this is uh, this is a photo. It's a, so of course from many years ago with my dear, uh, with Jules, my dear colleague, my colleague and friend. This is, this is, uh, this is photo of some persons with large experience in this, uh, in this pathology. Paolo Capabianca, you know, the leader of the endoscopical uh, from Naples, uh, is a good friend of mine also. And uh, was the, the, you know, the, the the leader and the pioneer uh, with with endoscopical approach, my dear friend uh, Edward Lowe's Now he is still working in 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 Harvard, in Harvard with five thousand cases. Uh, he his team moved also to an, a complete endoscopical approach, and of course Rudolf Falbusch from uh, uh, Erlangen, and now in Hanover. In Hanover, also a large, a large experience in this uh, in pituitary treatment of uh, of, all, of, of all those uh, this cellular pathology, pituitary adenoma, like ourselves also, uh, not only or cranial pharyngiomas and all this pathology, of course. 
So the transcranial, the transcranial is reserved for adenomas with large extension of adhering superior remand, even not only in 2007, but even, but, but even, even today. And so for instance, this adenoma, I, I'm talking not endoscopically, but with microsurgery in this tumor with the, like with the uh, lateral extension, so it was it was interesting passing through you know the different hiatus, a, a, a prechiasmatic, later, lateral optical hiatus and lateral and, la, and lateral uh, uh, um, uh, lateral to carotid artery to to remove to remove the tumor. So you know the, the for in some cases, if the group are not uh, has not experienced with endoscopical modern endoscopical control is still this this uh, uh, subfrontal approach is still uh, ne necessary but remember this this guy in this case no way no discussion that was a, a, a patient operated by me many years many, many years ago this tremendous pituitary adenoma as you can see here was completely removed as you see here this is the craniotomy, and this is the patient in, 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 in post-surgery. So no way for this tumor, I think the transcranial approach is still, is absolutely, is absolutely necessary and, and, and safer for the patient. But in, in, in many years, in the last years, we use the minimal invasive anterior approach. Why? Because because, because the trans elbow allowed, allowed us, uh, uh, you know, preserving one important complication, which is the, the, the you know, in the, in, the, in the transcranial approach, the lesion of the olfactory nerve. The trans elbow approach allowed remo remove the tumor with the, in the complete, with the preservation of the olfaction, not touching, of course, not touching at all. The, uh, the 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 olfactory nerve you see here. Well, I don't want to bother you with this thing, but the remotion is classical, and you know, and you know here you can see the, the total remotion of the tumor with the preservation of the of the of the of the nerve. Well, this is this is this is our our series, as I said in my first slide. You know. Secreting represent for us the 64% of our series. Maybe maybe it's more than more than this, more, more than you see 300, 500 now. But uh, anyway, anyway, and non-secreting, non-secreting the 36, 66%. So we need to know. I'm sorry, with, with the time, maybe you should tell me. We need to know the greatest invasiveness for taking therapeutic decision, mainly in functional, in functional adenomas, low chance of successful with surgical approach only. So this is, this is the, this is the, you know, we have no invasive, you know, this is classification of Alexander and Michael and this not classification all is the same, you know. With no no invasive uh, adenomas, uh, mainly all all uh, into the cella turcica. So so um, every every possible every possible uh, simple approach can be can be done. And of course, in invasive adenoma, mainly the invasion to the cavernosinus or the supracellular region, or or uh, and in, uh, in in all those in, in all those areas is necessary to 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 perform, or if possible, a total remotion with technical uh, uh, endoscopical technique, or we need, of course, the help of the of the endos, uh, endocrinologist. The concept of benign tumor in, in, pituitary, in pituitary tumor not considered the extension, the invasion, the consistency, infiltration, behavior, morbid mortality, and the presence of metastasis to distance. So we have to think nowadays in a different classification of the, of the adenomas. Uh, that means typical pituitary adenomas are atypical pituitary adenomas. Because to classify the, the, the is a benign tumor, but if it's a typical, for the said that it's a typical, we should, we should do, we have three conditions. First of all, the elevated mitotic index is necessary, and MIB1 leveling index more than 
and an extensive nuclear reactivity for P53. This is very important. And then with all those things, we can, we can uh, finally have, which is not fortunately very frequent, epituitary carcinoma. This uh, typical tumor identified in 50 percent, we can, we can find a typical uh, with all these conditions, but also being atypical can be aggress aggressive as, as in this case. So in pituitary salinomas, we need the team. And the, and the team is, of course, first of all, who discovered the tumor in general are endocrinologists, then the surgeon, and then the endocrinologist again. That's why our team has been very, very uh, important for the very beginning. The team with um, image nowadays, Im image MRI, clinical biochemical and pathologies. All these teams are uh, led us to arrive to the best, re the best, the best result for the patient. Prolactinomas, there's still a place for surgery. Okay, you know that with surgery, historically, uh, with the microprolactinomas, all the all these series uh, 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 with my in my series. The 82%, of course, we have a cure, in, cure it just with, the, with, with surgery. And the, the, the recurrent rate in 70%. And mortality practically zero with, uh, with, uh, with only with surgery. But fortunately, in the, in the 70s and 80s, start the medical therapy with very good result with the dopamine, uh, sorry, with the, with the dop, with the, no, no, no. With the, with the dopamine agonist, promocryptin or cabergoline, uh, if doesn't work for any reason, surgery or radiotherapy or radio, or radio surgery. But uh, here you see the result in prolactinoma. After one year of cabergoline, you see the tumor practically, practically disappear. And in this, in this case, with promocryptin, you know, one month, Without in one year with, with treatment, with treatment, uh, uh, you know, uh, with uh, with bromocryptin, practically the, the tumor de disappear, you know, and then and then uh, with bromocryptin here we can arrive after nine years of bromocryptin to completely completely disappear of the tumor. In some cases, with so good result, we have to operate the patient to solve the problem. Of the of of the leak, it happened to me with a with a with a colleague a doctor with that with that uh, with, with that uh, complication. This this case just with cabergoline, this tumor disappeared completely. The tumor after you know 18 months under cabergolines, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. In some cases, still in prolactinomas. In this case that I have to operate in you know in 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 uh, urgently was because an acute visual disturbance, we cannot, in, in this 20, 20, 27 all male uh, start to the, you know, the, 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 the reaction to, to agonists. So we operate uh, in urgence. Some resistance is, is still uh, to, 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 to bromocryptin come to surgery, et cetera, et cetera, indication for surgery. In, in GA secreting tumor, we have here an example of a giantist. He was a basketball player, you know, even, even in, in the United States. I, I finally, I operate this guy in Buenos Aires. And, and this is one of my patients, which is now he has a foundation for acromegaly. He, he, she is the president of a foundation for, uh, for a, a patient with pituitary problems. So uh, this is, this is the, the this is the, you know a tremendous a tremendous disease. This is the the the, the normal I don't I, uh, the, the the normal uh, GAs uh, GAs in, in in blood and and the normal IGF one should be should be normal. But you know life expectancy expect, expectancy in in people with acromegaly you see depending of the of the of the level. Of, of growth hormone, you know, is coming down, coming down, and coming down. So we have to operate when it's when it's possible, uh, when when it's possible this patient. 
So in acromegaly, the, 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 the treatment goals, clinical control, biochemical control, and tumor control is, is, is possible. So surgery is the first choice, it's mandatory, but in, in acromegaly, we have some other treat, treatment with somato, somatostatin analog, you know, octotreat, landrotreat, passive rotit. Finally, we learn, and the endocrinologists take those patients. In some patients, we make a mixture of somatostatin analog in mixed, mixed tumor with dopaminergic, dopaminergic agonists also, and radiotherapy or, or, or radiosurgery, but surgery is mandatory. Some, some new drugs, as pervisoman, uh, uh, can control the, uh, the, the, uh, and produce the, redu the reduction of, of GH hormone, but the effect of tumor side are still, are still unknown nowadays. This is a, a, a rare, rare case of uh, before make the treatment uh, functional, uh, very, very good, but this is not common as is necessary uh, to operate. And one thing more important in pituitary surgery is the surgical team expertise. You know, uh, with, uh, in, in group with surgical team expertise, the, 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 the literature and our results also, in micro 91% of good results, in macro 71 uh, for good results. So this is this is very, very, very important. The experience of the experience of the team. In ACT, a secreting tumor is very, is very important, you know, the surgery, because we have no medical treatment until today. You know, the classical mini G, the uh, uh, mini G patient that uh, has been uh, treated in, 19, in 1912 by Harvey Cushing, uh, but he published these basophil adenomas on the pituitary body and their clinical manifestation in, in, uh, in 30, 32 only. But of course, you see how they uh, destroy uh, the body of a, of a patient, this terrible, this terrible uh, 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 disease that is produced by, by an excess of ACTH that, the, that produce an enormous, you know, pro production of cort cortisol that coming back to the, to the, to the hypothalamus is the, is the circles, you know, to the releasing factors. But uh, you see that uh, one, one of my patients, this, 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 this young woman became like this, another case, you know, with the almost pituitary with intraoperative microadenoma producing this, this result, this, this disease. But anyway, uh, surgery, again, I insist, is the, is the, only, is the only possibilities to, uh, to uh, uh, solve the patient because Cushing disease produces mortality, four times uh, uh, called sex and age pair, uh, cardiovascular complication, diabetes, Obesity, obesity with dyslipidemia, coagulopathy, osteoporosis, cognitive and psychiatric disorders. Psychiatric disorder has been also very important. I remember, I remember one patient with in, in, in our hospital, unfortunately, during, during he was waiting for, a, for, a, for, for, for the, 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 the day of surgery, she commit suicide and uh, 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 in, the, in those in, in that terrible case you know all of this is in the in the hands of endocrinologists but of course in our hands to the diagnostic the the the, the pituitary tumor uh, as neurosurgeon is of course the mri and the bilateral inferior petrosa sinus sampling is necessary to determine you know the difference, the difference, uh, the, the difference of ACTH in the in the cavernous sinus, in the cavernous in the in the cavernous sinus, or in or in uh, and in, in periphery for one side or the other. So the, the treatment is the elimination of the tumor mine, preserving the pituitary the pituitary function. Surgical treatment. Uh, I will show you, this is, this is the literature, but uh, depends, of course, always on the skill and experience of the surgeon of the cure criteria used. This is, this is our series. 
in our series in this group or, or two, 232 patients with Cushing disease. Adenomectomies has been made in 62%. Remission of 70, uh, in, uh, 143 patients with remission in 77% of the, of the disease. In some cases, we were obliged because the, the, the tumor in some, not, not anymore now, but in some cases we, we perform hypo, total hypo, hypophysectomies, which was much better than the total suprarenalectomy that can produce the Nelson syndrome. Uh, uh, so in, in, this, in this case, we have remission in, in, in 71% negative exploration failure in 100% of the cases. Okay, so in conclusion, in Cushing disease, surgery remained the first choice. A medical treatment, uh, not really no, 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 uh, no uh, very good uh, till nowadays. So surgery is absolutely necessary. And in non-functioning, finally, for pituitary adenomas, surgery is absolutely the best, the best result. And the completely and the complete uh, remotion of the tumor is the solution. The 74% were silent good allotrope adenomas in the literature in our experience also. And they were, uh, they were not, we are not going into details, but they, it was, you know, the, the 70, the 64 were silent gonadotrop adenomas in general. The new future is the molecular biology and genetic in pituitary adenomas. I will finish with this. And you see, we have a group in Argentina, the, the, this group of researchers, they, 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 they had a, a, you know, a prize for this. And the objective of the, process, the project is to find molecular markers that predict the behavior and response to therapies in pituitary tumors. We, we focus the process of angio uh, angiogenesis and cellular signal that's regular the tumor. You know, I, I, I have it because I, I, I travel in the last 20 years, uh, I had been many, many times to China. Finally, I, 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 I signed, a, 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 you know, an, an agreement with the group of, uh, of uh, Beijing. And, and, and now, the, you know, the, the, the Beijing, the people from Beijing come to Buenos Aires and people from Buenos Aires went to Beijing. And, you know, the idea, the idea, the idea was to, oh, excuse me, no, no. The idea was to uh, determine angiogenesis and cell signaling in pituitary, in, in pituitary tumorogenesis. That was, that was the, 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 the result they are working, they are, they are working together nowadays. You know, they, they, they publish, they, they have some publication, the same, the same group relation between dopamine. Now, now that I'm, I'm, I'm less in, in, in the operating room, but more in, in the lab, I, uh, I, I pay attention in the results of this uh, research program at, uh, with that group. Of course, we cannot forget the possibility of radiotherapy, but in, in many cases, but mainly radio surgery with gamma night is my choice. In general, I recommend when it is not possible, nor, nor uh, surgical treatment, nor the, uh, the, the, the biological the biological or medical or medical treatment. In conclusion, my dear friends, surgery constitutes still the treatment of choice of the majority of pituitary adenomas, fortunately for us neurosurgeons. However, other therapeutic options such as pharmacological, radiosurgery, and radiotherapy has been proposed in functional adenomas or in particular clinical settings. And of course, I thank you so much to, uh, to the, the group, to Yoko Kato, my dear friend Yoko uh, from Nagoya, Professor Raja uh, and Professor Fontanella, who is the chairman of this session, uh, for, uh, for having invited me to this important, uh, important uh, group and this important uh, session 
of the Asian Congress of Neurological Surgery. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Professor Basso. Uh, I don't know, but I think uh, we have very small space for question. Would... Yes, you may give your expert comments and we'll wind this up. Yeah. Uh, no. a, a lot of topics. Uh, you, you spoke uh, about a lot of topics, uh, uh, microscopy, endoscopy and then several kind of uh, pituitary uh, tumors and uh, i think uh, uh, it's all very clear i think but if there are questions if there are questions professor mac any comments from you um <clears throat> of course it's always fascinating to um learn from uh, giants like professor basso's um vast experience i would say i i am still in um uh, luck that I I had actually some experience with a microscopic um, uh, sublabial approaches as well, and um, uh, just one question and a comment: um, the um, behavior of um, adenomas, invasive adenomas, is always really challenging. And um, uh, from your experience in research, is there any um, target uh, therapy or treatment targets that can be used for especially invasive um, pituitary adenomas, um, uh, those especially silent um, ACTH secreting uh, adenomas that are notoriously uh, being recurrent and um, uh, um, uh, invasive? No, no, not, unfortunately, dear, dear uh, Professor Kalming, not, not yet, but they are working very hard, the group of researchers. I think I think this, this uh, we have seen in the next years, uh, many things has been changed for this, this kind of tumor. Aggressive tumor, you know, um, that having, having, per, having full the, the, the three conditions that I mentioned you, this is, this, is, this is the beginning and we arrived to that today. But they are working very hard. I think in the next future, in the literature, we can. I, I you know, I, I have the feeling that uh, the new generation, you will see for sure that that, and you you will have less work in in surgery. <laughs> so, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry for. I'm sorry for for those things. That's what. That's why for me it's very important the um, your generation and even the youngest generation that you uh, uh, be aware and they know they have to know how the things come to until today in the last hundred, hundred years but mainly in the in the last uh, in the last uh, 20 or 30 years uh, the progress has been you know amazing so and i have the fortune to, to, to having live personally all this progress of uh, in the last uh, more than 50 years, you know? So, you know, I have, I have 50, 55, um, even more than that experience in neurosurgery. So with so many, not, not only in pituitary, but, but of course in every, many, every kind of meningiomas, uh, you know, posterior, uh, I have a large series on acoustic neurinomas or whatever. So cardiopharyngiomas, we can talk on so many, so many topics, you know, <laughs> so, uh, but, but, but anyway, be confident that in the future, you will see the, the progress for this uh, tremendous, uh, uh, guys, fortunately, few cases. Eh? Fortunately, few cases, few cases, but the but are deadly cases. So, so really, we hope that our researchers arrive to to that uh, that, that that result. Thank you. Thank you again. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. We can take one comment from my co-host Liu Bun Singh. Okay, uh, thanks, 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 Professor Basso, for very uh, comprehensive uh, lecture. Just a uh, one, one short question, Professor. Uh, do you think that uh, nasal septal flap are still relevant? A nasal nasal uh, septal flap that have been uh, popularized, and I think uh, now these people hardly use the and and dura suturing, Professor. Closure for for uh, endoscopic endonasal approach. Thank you, Professor. Well, what uh, that 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 wasn't a question. I, I have been I, I have been concerned by the septal nasal uh, vascularized flap, 
because it has been described. I remember in a small, small meeting in the, in the city of Rosario, Argentina, which is not the, cap, the great capital. And, in, and I, when I, I was fascinated for that possibility. And we start immediately to, uh, to, to my, my, my group immediately start to use that in, in Argentina. And you know that uh, 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 the person with a large experience, Hassan, that you know him very well, I know him also very well, has been in my house. Uh, uh, Hassan, uh, uh, you know, you know, I came to Buenos Aires. He met in uh, he met uh, uh, Doctor Hort, uh, Hort, Doctor, you know, from Rosario, and uh, and uh, uh, Doctor Adar teach him, and and of course, the the you know the the Hassan result has been improved a lot. Of lot and so many and so many experiences endoscopical neurosurgeons uh, uh, improve a lot uh, because it was necessary because the, the you know the leak complication and infectious complication before the you know the discover of uh, my friend Adat in in Rosario has been tremendous as it, it was solved with the vascularized flap so it was an enormous contribution. For the for the endoscopical approach of the cell of the cell region, of course, was very very nice. He was a nice friend, a nice a nice friend and a nice person, uh, Doctor Adat. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Professor. Thank you very much. We can take the concluding remarks from Professor Fontanella. Well, it was a very interesting topic and speech. And uh, we see as a, a, a huge neurosurgeon with a big experience uh, can pass through all this time from uh, 1965 from Guyot. I remember that uh, Professor Basso has the Legion d'honneur uh, that uh, in Europe is a very big uh, honor. And uh, uh, from to the... Um, uh, endoscopic uh, endoscopy um, just studying and uh, uh, learning from other groups uh, learning from dnts and through other surgeons this is not very usual we still have uh, in the world that uh, and we all uh, are very used to perform uh, some things in the same way because uh, we are very confident to use to use uh, the same way to, to do things, but just moving from one approach and one type and one kind of approach to another is just for the giants. So thank you very, very much, Professor Basso. And we know that we, we have to improve. We, we saw the transorbital approach that <clears throat> perhaps will be the, the, the next, the future of our surgery, of uh, one of the approaches uh, that, that we can use in the future. And uh, we still have to learn. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for teaching us this. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fontanella. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very much. And thank you. It was a very wonderful lecture, taking us through the travel of pituitary surgeries from the 1960s to the present. So I will wind this up officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato. I would like to thank both the speakers of today, Professor Calvin Mack and Professor Armando Vasso, and the wonderful chairs, Professor Walter Sheen and Professor Marco Fontanella for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. A special thanks to Professor Shubin, who has been our main mentor in China and has supported us all throughout our journey by giving us access to world-class speakers and broadcasting these webinars in China. Today, we had 1,450 viewers who have joined us on Zoom, YouTube, and we a special thanks to my co-host, Dr. Liu Boon Seng from Malaysia for joining in today. So until we all meet on next Saturday, it is bye-bye from everybody. Thank you very much for joining.